Well, good morning, church. Come on, who's excited to be in the house of the Lord? Amen, would you stand with us?
sacrifice that you desire is a broken and contrite heart. Father God Almighty, I pray God that you, oh God, will be glorified in this place this morning, Lord God. Lord God Almighty, I pray God that you will fellowship with your people this morning in the name of Jesus. Lord, as we present our sacrifice before you, as we present our praise before you, Lord, I pray God that faith will 
arise in the house of the Lord in the name of Jesus. Lord, because without faith, it is impossible to please you. And Lord, we want to please you in everything we do. So Father God Almighty, I pray God that you will arise, oh God. Arise, mighty God, in our midst, mighty God, and show forth your glory. Mighty God, arise in our midst and show forth your power. Arise in our midst and show forth your strength, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Let the praises of your people, mighty God, ascend into the heavenlies, mighty God. I pray, God Almighty, that you touch your people, energize them, mighty God. Lift their faith this morning in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask of you, mighty God, to cover the praise team, mighty God. Lord, as they carry us deeper into your presence this morning, mighty God. For Lord, we need your presence, Lord God. We got to have you near us, mighty God. We got to have your presence, Lord God. Because without you, we are nothing, mighty God. So Lord God Almighty, let praise arise, mighty God. Mighty God, in spirit and in truth, in the name of Jesus. Mighty God, bring us into truth, into true worship this morning, where it's all about you in the name of Jesus. All about you in the name of Jesus. Mighty God, I pray that you cover even the speaker. Evangelist Duane, mighty God. Lord, I pray, God, that you'll use him in a unique way this morning, mighty God. Lord, I pray, God, that, Lord, you will declare your word, mighty God, with power this morning in the name of Jesus, with boldness and with confidence in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray, God, that your people will be blessed by your word in the name of Jesus. Lord, make your name be glorified in this place today. In Jesus' mighty name and the church of God, say amen. Good morning, New Life. My name is Patricia. My name is Sweetie. We are very excited that you chose to worship with us this morning. Our vision at New Life Church of God is for you to. Um, our vision at New Life Church of God is to impact all cultures and generations for the cause of Christ. If you are joining us in person or online for the first time, or it's your first time in a long time, we would like to say welcome. New Life, can you give us? <laughs> Our desire is for you to find a community here. Um, behind us, there should be a QR code um, with our digital connection card. Um, if you didn't get one when you walked in, you can stop by at guest services. We have them in church. You can fill one out. This will give us the opportunity to connect with you and for you to learn more about what makes New Life a special place. This morning, there will not be Powerhouse Kids. Um, the, tr the kids will be with us this morning. Um, okay. If, you, if you're a student between grade 6, 12, or you're a, a parent of a student between this grade range, um, we would like to invite you or to encourage you um, to get connected to the Arise Youth Ministry. They are a youth, I mean, they are a youth group help during the fall and spring semester, youth camp over the summer, and youth hangouts throughout the year that includes skating, bowling, um, movie nights, as well as a lot of fun activities. If you'd like to get connected, please visit, visit guest services behind you. Um, you'll be able to scan the QR code so that you can be added to the group chat for the last, um, for any upcoming event. As well, um, usually we do have prayer force every Wednesday as well as um, Wednesday night live. However, this Wednesday we'll not have any of them because with, it is with great sorrow we are, we are announcing the passing away of, her, of one of her new life member, Gilbert Montero. He passed away this past Wednesday. 
um, we invite you guys to be praying with his family as well. Um, also, we invite you to his celebration of life service on Wednesday at 6 p.m. at the National Cremation of Burial Society. And at this time, we'll transition with Mac Jean and Dr. Sam Sigleton to get the latest updates about Wilman Ministry. Good morning, church. This is what happened when you, uh, when your wife pick out your clothes. We look like a youth choir. I don't know if y'all noticed that. Um, how y'all doing? Are you guys excited to be in the house? Are you guys excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Um, I just wanted to kind of talk about, it's been a while, it's been about a month and a half since yeah. Real Men took a break. So we kind of wanted to play a quick video about Real Men and we'll kind of talk to you about what Real Men is. Yeah, that's it. Clap it up. So Real Men season 11 is starting July 23rd, as you see. Real Men is a, can you tell us a little bit about Real Men, Mr. Press, <laughs> what it is and what we do? Yeah, so Real Men, um, it stands for Reliable, Empowering, Accountable, Loving Men. And so that's what we want to be um, as men of Christ. Um, so we're surrounded by five pillars. It's faith, family, community, wellness, and finances. And our goal is to empower men in order to thrive in these areas so that we can show God's glory to our dying world. Yeah, and our anchoring verse is Psalms 133 verse 1. It says, how good it is for brothers to dwell together in harmony. So we are starting, can I hear all the men in the house with a whoop? There, you, there it is, I felt that <laughs> earthquake a little bit. Um, so we are starting soon, July 23rd. Mark your calendars. If this is your first time, if, if you haven't been before, it's going to be a lot of good things happening, um, actually, that you'll be excited to see. I think it would be, it would be kind of remiss if we didn't do this part. He's not, he's not expecting this part. Our, our Mr. President, after five years, ladies and gentlemen, is leaving us. He's moving to, I know, that's what I said, too. He's moving to Texas as well. Um, but we definitely wanted to kind of surprise you and do this, brother. Um, we are extremely extremely honored to have had you for five years leading the helm. Um, men of few words, but men of substance. That's what you are. The, the moment that I met you, I learned a lot from you. A first, in, first interaction that we've had at your house. Um, I, I would be remiss if we, if we didn't honor you in public, right? And if we, if we didn't give you your flowers because you need it. You deserve it. You want it. All of that is for you. I know you sent your wife to Texas and you're excited to go meet them, but we wanted to also publicly honor you. I'm gonna ask the rest of the board to come up. Uh, we're gonna present this to you and Pastor, Pastor Dale, please come up as well. It is a small token of our appreciation um, as you are on your way. Um, we hate it, but you know, you, you gotta go. <laughs> Pastor Joel, can you come up please to the rest of the board so we can take a picture. Sister Victoria, can you take a picture for us? It says, real men, iron sharpens iron. Dr. Sam Singleton, July 14, 2024. And grateful recognition of your many years as the real men president. Well, when all fails, give it to Pastor Dale. He'll say something. Come on. Brother Sam, thank you for your service around here. We love you. We love your family, your children. I just got a beautiful family, and we're going to miss you. You're such a blessing. Come on, somebody. I'm still praying for your lawnmower, too. Come on. <laughs> That's up between him and I. As I was preparing for the offering this morning, the Lord laid on my heart to share this scripture, and I've shared this over the years a couple times, but the Lord showed me something in this, so let me read this, and then I'll, there's 
a couple of points I want to share with you. So while Jesus was in the temple, he was watching the rich people dropping in their gifts in the collection box. Jesus sees who's given. Amen? That's the first point. Jesus sees who's given at any given time. Come on. Then a poor widow came by the came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them. He knows your heart. He knows your heart. See, it wasn't about how much the widow gave. All the rich people gave so much money. They were given twice as much, three times, probably five times more than that widow could give. But she wanted to give. She wanted to give. For they have given a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. Are you willing to give everything? And we're talking not only finances at this point. I'm talking about are you willing to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your talent? Come on. Come on. But Jesus knows who gives. He watches. He knows your heart. He knows you're forgiven. He really does. And then make sure you're given because you love the Lord. See, she loved the Lord so much, she was given the, everything she had to the kingdom's work. She didn't have to. She chose to. What a heart. And the last thing, just give abundantly from all that you have. See, the rich people did give out a, a, surplus, a, a surplus of what they had. But sometimes we might not have, but won't you give her your time? You have surplus time? Won't you pray for somebody? Won't you walk next door and uh, see your neighbor and encourage your neighbors? Be a tool in God's hands. Go beyond just the financial support, but support people with your time, with your love, and with your heart. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we just pray you bless the offering as we give today. And I, we all know, according to Scripture, you know the deepest secrets of a man's heart. You know all of our hearts, and you know what we give and what we don't give, and the reason we give and, when, uh, and how much we give. God, we just, we want to give because we love you. We want you to see a pure heart in us as we give. I pray each and every person will try you today. If they've never given, may they give from their heart. And Lord, when they give from, from their heart, they'll give beyond what they even thought they could. The widow gave everything. She gave beyond what she even had to be able to give because she had a heart for you. I pray that you would bless the ones who give today, stir the hearts of the ones who's never given God. And God, I just pray your honor, now the giver, in Jesus' name. Now we have a couple ways to give. You can step in the back, swipe your card and give that way. You can go online and give. And then you can give through the envelope and cash right up front. Won't you try, God? Show him your heart today. Do because you love him, not because you have to, not because you, oh, I got a little extra money. I can do it now, but I can do it because I love you, Lord. Amen? Amen. Come on, somebody.
Let's all stand as we press back into worship this morning.
Just lift our hands and just worship him no more time. Come on, house. Come on, church. Let's worship him. Come on, worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb. Let's just love on him a little bit. Come on, somebody. Just love on him. He is so worthy, so worthy to be praised. Lord, you're worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb of God who was slain from the foundations of the world. Thank you, Jesus. We just love on you this morning. 
Lord, now we just thank you for this worship service. We thank you, God, that you are in the house and just touch your lives, Lord. We just thank you for what you're going to do through Bishop Dwayne. I thank you, Lord, that you're going to touch lives, God. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive what the Spirit will be saying to the church today. May you honor our worship. May you honor our gifting today. And, God, may you honor all that we do from this point on. Anoint, use, and touch Bishop Dwayne in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And everybody can be seated. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, it's my honor to introduce Bishop Dwayne Harris. He's preached first before. He's a man of God. He's a God-fearing man, and he can preach. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. He's an ordained bishop in the Church of God, and he's been serving God for many years. And let's just give him a round of applause as he comes. Good to be in God's house, isn't it? You know, I was thinking a second ago as we were all sitting in here in, in worship, and sometimes we actually lose sight about what worship is even really about. And sometimes we think that we need to come into the into the house and to elevate God so that somehow He understands that He's worthy. How many of you know God's already worthy whether you realize it or not? How many of you realize He's already elevated whether you elevate Him or not? Worship has nothing to do with what you bring to God. I'm going to be honest with you. God doesn't even need your worship to be who he is. Because he already is holy. He already is worthy. He already is elevated. He already is above it all and in it all. And when you understand that worship really isn't about what you bring to God, it's really about God allowing you to connect with him. So when you worship him, really, in fact, what you are doing is you are plugging in to the reality of who God is, not so that he changes, but so that you change when you have the realization of who he is. Worship changes you. It never changes God. And so it becomes a steadfast feature that when you come into God's house, that we worship him, not so that he is pleased, but so that you connect with him in such a way that your life becomes changed because you realize you serve an awesome, awesome God. How many of you know you serve an awesome God? And so when you come in, I would challenge you not to bring to him, but to come to him and let the reality of who he is today change and shift who you are when you leave. See, that's, that's what God wants. That's what God wants. God didn't need you to drop some money off. God didn't need you to come here and show your face. No, no, no. God really just wanted to bring you in so he could have a moment with you so that you can capture something today that you can take out with you so that the world sees the power of God moving in and through you. How many of you agree with that? Why don't you stand to your feet? Let's just open up in prayer. I know sometimes we, you can pray in prayer. Guess what? Prayer becomes almost just like that worship. Prayer can come just a feature and a function that we do. But if prayer really becomes a genuine thing, when prayer becomes more than just an articulation and something you say, and it really becomes a position of your heart, if you'll ask God to touch you today, how many of you know he's going to touch you today? If you'll ask God to speak to you today, how many of you know he's got a word, he can speak to you? He doesn't need me to do it. No, the Holy Spirit knows how to speak to you. But when you position yourself, why don't you raise your hands? Why don't we just ask him today to touch us? Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you, Lord. Lord, you're so good and you're so worthy, Lord, and I pray that you would give us the realization that we could understand the fullness of who you are, Lord, so that we could be changed. Lord, so that we could be changed. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask you to come into this house here this morning. I ask you to let your spirit saturate us, Lord. I ask your spirit to saturate the word, to guide and to lead not only the mouth, but, Lord, to guard the heart and to guide the eyes and ears of the heart to hear and to receive today what you have for us. Lord, strengthen us and feed us. Come on, somebody say, feed me. Holy Spirit, feed us. Give us nourishment today that we can be strengthened and stand under your strength and under your anointing and under your covering, Lord, and do your work. And we'll give you praise and thanks for it. In Jesus' name, and the body said, amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Brother Zach. I want to thank Pastor Mark, you know, I, I, I was almost offended when I found out he wanted me here, but he didn't want to be here. Come on. <laughs> it's, it's, it says something, but, but, but it says something about our relationship. And I love Pastor Mark 
and the first lady, and, and I love Zach, and I love the church family here. Uh, you, you guys have been a special part uh, to our ministry. We've always enjoyed the fellowship that we've had together. I enjoy the fellowship of worship inside this church. I enjoy, see, sometimes you have to go preach places that are just kind of a little bit dead. Come on, can I, can I just be honest with you? Sometimes you gotta, you, you gotta wonder, you gotta look outside and even wonder if you're in the right place because there are certain places that just don't really know how to position themselves to receive. But we thank the Lord. We've always loved your church, love what Pastor Mark uh, does here, and just love the, the receptivity of the body here. So today, uh, I, I wanna share with you and I wanna talk to you about even if, even if. And sometimes, really, the challenge is, is, is not what will you face, but when you face what you're going to face. How will you handle it? And so I want to talk about a faith that allows you to say even if, and, and we'll go into the Bible and we'll look back in Daniel uh, uh, here in a bit, and, and, and taking that phrase from Daniel and the three Hebrew children. Now, if you know the story, you realize that King Nebuchadnezzar came in and he swooped in with just all the power and might that he had as a kingdom. He came in and he swooped into Jerusalem. He destroyed, he took, he captivated. Uh, he took everything that he wanted out of the land and took all God's people that had any worth or value to him back to Babylon where he, or, or, where he kept them in basically slavery where they were contained and he had kept all the prize items of God and he had extracted them. And so... When you find the story in Daniel, you'll see that when you look at Daniel and the three Hebrew children, you'll realize that their life is in a series of testing. And the Bible is not simply about the testing, it's about the faith that you can see in the midst of the test. That's what the book is about. The book isn't about the hardships, the book isn't really about the, the suffering, the book is about how you can face hardships and suffering, and even when you come to the point that you are challenged, that you need to bow down you can have enough faith to stay, listen, I will not bow down, and, and my God is able to deliver me, but even if he doesn't, even if. So today I challenge you to get a faith that can say even if. So many people have a, have a, have a personal relationship with God that is hinged on what he does for them. It's a if faith. Well, God, if you do that, well, then I can praise your name. God, when you do that, then I'll come into church and I'll give a little bit of my resource. If and when you do this, then I will know that you're a real God. But if I come to church and I get offended, then I'm never coming back to church. Come on. Because sometimes faith becomes very self-centered and self-centered faith always says if and when. But when you get a God-centered faith that realizes you serve God because of who he is and not what he does, you can then say even if. Come on. Come on, anybody ever had to say, even if, looking at your circumstance? Even if it doesn't work the way that I thought it should work, I'm still praising him and I'm still giving him glory. Even if I get offended, I'm still coming back. Come on, I'm not coming back to get even. Some people come back to get even. Some people just know that you just got to come back. Come on. And so sometimes you need to check yourself so that you realize what level of faith do you really possess and what is your relationship with God really like? And I'm here to tell you that testing will do just that. Testing will allow you to see the level of faith that is on the inside of you and actually reveal the caliber of how you perceive God and how you trust God and how you serve God. So some of you know that usually when we came here in times past, you've seen me and my wife sit up here, my beautiful bride. In fact, she was the better part of the equation because now you're just stuck with ugly. She's not here. So I'm, but, but, but here over the past 10 months, and I know some of you in the church were aware, I know Pastor Mark uh, had been praying and reaching out throughout our journey. Uh, my wife was, was battling cancer for 10 months. We just lost her three weeks ago. And I could say lost her, but the truth is we did not lose her. The truth is she claimed her victory. She took over the prize that is awarded to everybody who serves the Lord diligently. Come on. And when we started the journey, when we found out that she had cancer, there was a statement that we used to always make. We would always look at each other, we'd sit out, we'd be like, God is so good to us. And listen, we don't have all these elaborate things that you could look through our life and say, well, I don't see God doing wonderful things. No, no, no. No, it's about the small things. How many of you realize it's really about the small things in life? And we would look at our children who are all sitting inside a church. They're not here today, but they're sitting inside a church. And we would look through and we would say, God is so good to us. 
And I remember driving one day down I-4 on my way into work, and I was just doing what I would normally do, just praising the Lord, you know, running people off the road, don't even know what's happening because I'm just caught up in worship. And I'll just hit it on repeat, and I don't know, I'll, I'll wake up and be two cities down. Come on, anybody know how to drive and worship? Come on. Some of my best worship happens in the car. It, it, uh, it's a good thing I'm in law enforcement because you ain't going to give me a ticket. But I'm just saying, man. But, but I remember driving down the road, and, and as I was driving down the road, I was just saying, man, God, you're just so, you're just so good. And I remember feeling in my spirit that that's going to be tested. That it's easy to say God is good, but even if, come on. So 10 months, we had a diagnosis for a very fast, rapid, moving, aggressive form of cancer. She had a cervical cancer. We went into about a two-month run of treatment that was just hideous. She went through all kinds of things. But at the end of the two months, we got a good report. And when she was checked, they said, it looks like all the activity is gone. We see no signs or trace of the cancer whatsoever. And we praise the Lord. And we praise the Lord. And then all of a sudden, we go back two months later for just a routine check. And they said, well, uh, you know, I don't know what this is, but we see some things inside your lungs, and we see some, some things inside your lymph nodes, and we see some, some things inside on your bone, on your arm. And they began to look, and they said, yes, it, it looks like it's cancer. Unfortunately, it looks like it's spread. And we once again entered right back into a season of heavy-ended treatments. We would complete about three to four of those treatments, and we would be sitting out on our 30th anniversary down at the beach. And I remember it was a Thursday we were sitting down there at the beach and we got the Lord's report, but even though we got the report that said all the metastatic activity inside your lungs and all that is now gone, we don't see anything. She was experiencing some of the worst headaches she had ever had, so much so that we couldn't even hardly leave the room and celebrate the fact that we had heard this good news. We would come back, we would go into the hospital, we would go into the ER, we would be leaving with pain, with this, trying to manage. She ended up having some stroke-like features and when we went back in the hospital, for the last run, they went in and they said, what we thought was initially embolisms in your brain is actually cancer that has spread now to the brain. And they began to see the features and the functions inside the tests and the scans. We went into the hospital, never thought that we weren't coming back home. Come on. Never thought that we weren't coming back. And if you look through the pathway, many people over the last 10 months, we have had people praying from every state throughout the nation. We have had people sending us cards, giving us posts, praying and believing for the Lord's healing. I, I, I'm assure you, you didn't believe for the Lord's healing any greater than I did. But I'm here to tell you today that God didn't either heal her to be God. And we had already settled that. Because even while we were sitting in there and would get a report that was bad, we would still be making declarations. Our God is so, so good. Come on, can I tell you that when you have a faith in God, I'm not saying that, you could, that, that you're going to go unscathed. I'm just saying that you can manage and walk through things that other people can't walk through. And while we were sitting in there, we, we would still make the declaration that God is so good to us. And I'll share a little bit more about how that, how that plays out, but, but I want to keep a little bit on the storyline, and I want to follow a little bit with, with the journey that we experience, along with the journey that these Hebrew children had to go through to they could get to the point to say, even if, even if. I want you to know that in life, you don't get to choose what you face. You don't get to choose what you face. But you do get to determine how you face it. And sometimes prayer and faith can move mountains. How many of you have ever seen prayer and faith move mountains? Come on, in our household, we have seen God do divine, supernatural healings. I declare that we serve a healing God. Can I tell you that Stacy didn't die to cancer? Listen, she already lived out her appointed days. God, from the beginning of time, had appointed her days. We were not robbed. She got every moment God had promised her. Because if it was not her time, cancer could not have even taken her. Listen, you're going to get what God has given you. It's not really about how you die. It's really about how are you living with the life you got. And so as we look at that, one thing I understood was when I look at the, the, the three Hebrew children, and, and when I look at our circumstances, it's really about what does your problem say about you and what do you say about your problem? Because determining your outcome is really hinged upon the fact of how big is your problem versus how big is your God. Because when your problem becomes bigger than your God, then your problem is bigger than your faith. Come on. And it's easy to trust God if God's bigger. But what about when the report seems bigger than your God? See, unless God is always bigger than, your faith is not sufficient. And when you see that the three Hebrew children, when King Nebuchadnezzar came and swooped in and took all these people, 
he began to do some very unique things to them. He began to purge them. He destroyed everything from the old past. Oh, those clothes, that's how you used to look. No, 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 not now. Now you're going to put these on. Now you're going to look like I want you to look. Oh, that name, Michelle. Oh, uh, Azariah, no, no, no. Uh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah, that'll do. Come on. He began to change their names, change their identities, change the way they looked. Why? Because sometimes whatever takes you captive wants to change your mindset about who you think you are. And if you're ever going to fall captive to the enemy, it's only going to be when you adopt his identity versus the identity that God has given you. And so he begins to give them three different names, three different identities, but even though everybody else sees them like this, they still saw themselves like that. Come on. It's not about what you face, it's about how you face it. Come on, that's the truth. That's the truth. And so they change, they got their names changed, but there was something on the inside of them that says, I don't adapt to what you're trying to put on top of me. Have you ever realized that your problem will try to give you an identity? Your issue tries to give you an identity? Well, you know, I'm just not like I used to be. Why? Well, you know, because I went through this. That's why I don't act the same. That's why I don't talk the same. That's why I just kind of go off sometimes. Why? Because I went through this. No, no, no. You're allowing your problem to put an identity on you that's not from God. Can I tell you the identity of God is greater than the issue that you face? And you should be able to weather the storm and not be changed in your identity. And so it doesn't matter who and what everybody else says about you. It doesn't matter what they see on you. They should still be able to see the identity on the inside of you. And that's the power of an even if, even if faith. Even if. Even if everybody says I am, I know who I really am. Even if circumstances have robbed me from what I thought I needed, even if that happens, I still know who I am in the Lord Jesus Christ. Circumstances don't have to dictate your identity. Your faith will. Your faith will. And the thing is, if you don't have a bedrock of faith to stand upon, then you will lose your identity. And when you lose your identity in God, you lose your authority in God. And see, if you're going to survive the issue in front of you, you need an authority. Come on. You need the authority and the power of Christ on the inside of you so that you can speak to mountains, so you can step and function and flow in faith, and so you can't afford to lose your identity because there is your authority. Some of y'all know I work in law enforcement. I still serve in, in, in full-time duty. I've been in law enforcement for 23 years. Served out in, in, in Volusia County for a while out by Port Orange, PD out by the beach, and there was, a, there was an officer that I worked with, and and and. and his name was Officer Sleeps. I worked out with him for a while, and we, we'd kind of hit some of the same areas of road. So at nighttime, we'd work night shift. We'd kind of buffer in zones. And so if he went to a call, I would typically go to a call, and I would see him there. And I liked Officer Sleeps because uh, Officer Sleeps was smaller and shorter than I am. Come on. Now listen, when a five foot seven boy can call you short, that's saying something. I'm just telling you, Officer Sleeps was down to here. I felt, like, I felt like everybody else gets to feel. And I was like, man, this just feels good. And when I was standing next to him, they say, no, the short guy. I'm like, yeah, the short guy. You know, I, just, I, I love the feeling that it brought. And, 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 and Officer Sleese had served in the military, and he'd had a knee injury. And because he had this knee injury, he had, he, he, had, he had a propensity for the knee just to pop out. And when it would come out, he would just fall down. I mean, just, just plain day, walking down the hallway, and boom, there goes Sleese hitting the floor. It was like a common occurrence. It just became like this, this side note. And I remember... One day during spring break, he was sitting out there on Dunlawton Avenue, and cars were getting going over the beach, and it was a packed, it was a packed afternoon, cars coming through, and he, whoop, he lights somebody up, and he starts to walk up, and he's walking up to a car full of a bunch of young people, and they're just waiting to hit the beach, right? Probably smoking, drinking, come on, I'm just telling you, I'm thinking I'm putting my cop hat on. I'm just telling you what's probably going on inside this car, and Officer Sleeps begins to walk up to the car, and they're looking out, and as he's walking up, his knee gives out. And when his knee gives out, he falls into the trunk of the car, hits the trunk, and hits the ground. But doom, doom. And, it, and you imagine you're the one sitting inside this car. Now, you're already freaked out because the cop's coming. But then, did that boy just hit my head? <laughs> and all of a sudden, he's picking himself up, and all you can hear is laughter coming from inside the vehicle. I mean, just dying. Oh, my gosh. And they're just dying and rolling. May have to do with a little bit of smoking. I don't know. I'm just saying. They were just dying laughing. And to the point, he tried to pick himself up. Cars are sitting at the red light. They're watching him. And he's so embarrassed, he picks himself up, walks up 
and he tries to ask the driver for a driver's license, but the driver is cracking up so hilarious. Can they not even contain her? Like, I'm sorry, man, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. And, and, and what do you need? And they're just dying laughing. He finally just leaves, gets in his car and leaves. And, and they're just sitting there like, did that? Did that? Did, that's the favor of God. Come on, that's the favor of God. My gosh, God done struck that officer down and gave us a free one. I mean, that, I was out with him one night time and we were sitting out doing a, a DUI stop. He had stopped somebody who was DUI all over the roadway. And we was out, and it was a dark road, and there was one of those deep ditches. I'm talking like, like those ones that they cut. You, you, like you don't stand on the edge of some of these ditches. They just go like straight down. You could lose a car in some of these ditches. And he was sitting there on the side of the road, and, I'm, and I started the recording, and I'm recording him, and he started his investigation, and he's talking to the guy, and he, he's got a little bit of this Napoleon. You know, he's short. He's shorter than me, right? So, so he's a, and another thing, you know, you, you should be watching out with you. And he's just running his mouth a little bit. And the guy's just trying to process. This guy's just kind of wavering around. He's just drunk. He just, I mean, he's, he's taking a ride. He, he's just, he's drunk. He's looking around. He's yelling at him. He's trying to pay attention. All of a sudden, that knee gives out. Officer Sleeps goes down into the ditch. Now, I tried not to look down. I just kind of kept that camera up, and I could hear, I could hear the whole transition from the sliding to the water hitting. And I'm, and I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. And I just sat there, and, I'm, and you could see me laughing, that camera kind of going up and down as we played it back. And the guy's sitting here, and he's drunk, and he don't even know what happened yet. He's still looking. He's looking around, and he, he looks back and says, where'd that angry little guy go? <laughs> he's like, and he was gone. I'm telling you, if you lose face, you lose position. You lose position, you lose authority. If your issue and your crisis causes you to crumble to such a degree that you can't stand in your faith, you have lost what you need to win your battle. You have to have authority to accomplish the task. So if you're going to make it through and you're going to have an even if faith, don't let your problem dictate your outcome. Don't let your problem dictate your identity. Don't let it ever take you away from your authority. I want you to know something. Faith cannot be, here's a, here's a couple things that faith cannot be. Faith cannot be captured. The enemy took them, seized them, hurt them, harmed them emotionally, they had lost family members, they had lost all these things, life would never be the same for them. And even though they were wounded, their faith was intact. Because the one thing crisis cannot do is it cannot kill your faith. You determine the level of your faith. And so many times we think, well, if I go through this, then, then, then I just got to give up. I, I guess there's just no hope. No, 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 no. I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter what you go through. Faith is, is, is a bedrock. Faith can be steadfast. Faith is not dictated by your crisis, but faith will always be revealed by your crisis. Can't destroy it, but it's most definitely going to reveal it. You ever seen somebody go through a crisis and then watch how they handle it? Everybody has faith till somebody runs their mouth on you. Everybody has faith till somebody talks about your mama. Come on. <laughs> Isn't it funny how you can have faith until something bad happens and then, well, God, you know, I got a limit. No, no, no. What's happening is stress is revealing the quality of your faith. And so when you're going through an incident, I'm here to tell you that it doesn't have the power to destroy your faith, but it will most definitely reveal your faith. Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, 26, it says, the writer reads in, he says, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also the heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of the things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Can I tell you something? Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And you need to understand something. What he's saying is, listen, God, God's got something greater than this. How many of you know he's got something greater? How many, how many are you thankful he's got something greater than this? How many of you so happy he's got something better than this? Come on. And he tells us that, listen, things will be shaken so that only the things that cannot be shaken will remain. So what's he talking about? He's talking about the physical things, the temporal things, as opposed to the eternal and the spiritual things. And there are times in your life where you're going to go through a circumstance that is going to bring a shaking, and that shaking is there to determine what is the integrity of your faith. If an earthquake comes and hits a, hits a building, if we were sitting here in a zone and all of a sudden there was an earthquake that began to shake and push, you would see certain parts and features of the walls would begin to crack. The parts that were not steady, the parts that were not secured would begin to fall away. But if there's a structure there, come on, if there's a structure, even though it's shaken, it's still going to remain. 
When you go through a testing, it is there to determine the integrity of your faith. Sometimes we need to see what's really behind our walls because sometimes we are building some beautiful, beautiful lives that have no integrity. Come on. Just because you're in church doesn't mean you're churchy. In fact, there's an even greater problem. You can be churchy. Come on. It's not about what's on the walls of your life. It's not about what it looks like. It's not about how you paint it up. It's not about how it looks like and, and all the awards and all the titles. It's really not because sooner or later there's going to come a shaking. And when that shaking comes, only things of integrity will remain. And so there's a shaking that will come to test the integrity of your faith. But there's also a shaking that comes to produce fruit in a season. Fruit that can only be obtained in a certain season. Here's, if you've ever watched, back in the old day, you know, technology's done some wonderful things. Back in the old day, if you had an apple orchard, you would have to go up and then get around on a little crane, get on a ladder, go up and try to pick all the good ripe apples, push away from the other ones, find the ones that were ready, have to put yourself at risk to get to the tops of the trees. Not now. Now they, they got this device. They just come up to a tree. They drive up this crane. It comes around. It grabs the tree and begins to shake the tree. And everything that is ripe gets released. Shakes the tree and everything that is ripe and ready for season falls to the ground. But here's the problem is many of us don't want to be shaken because we don't want to release fruits. Come on. Because we like the way fruit looks on us as opposed to when fruit leaves us. Come on. Come on, I'm telling you the truth. We don't want God to shake us to the point that we have to break away from the things that we're used to. But can I tell you, in the middle of hard times, God reveals some of the most beautiful fruit. And if you'll allow him to shake you, Jesus said, listen, I'm even, look, I, I'm going to give my life. I'm going to lay it down. No man, no man takes my life, but I will lay it down so that it can be shaken and then I'll pick it back up. He allowed his life to be shaken so that fruit could be produced. And many of us want to serve God, but we want people to look at what's on our tree. And we want them to look at the fruit, but don't touch the fruit and don't ask for the fruit. And don't anticipate that I would ever give you the fruit. And really, if there is anything on your life that has value, it is not intended for you. Come on. So many people, well, you know, I just want, you know, I want people to see this gifting. I want people to see this talent. I want people to see this authority, this anointing you're hanging on to things that are supposed to be released. Your gifting is not for you. Your gifting is to be used. And if God has to shake you to get you to let go of some stuff, he'll shake you to get you to let go of some stuff. But if you'll realize that when a shaking comes, it's not really, even though it looks like it is harmful and destroying you, when you realize that there is something greater than this life, you can tolerate a shaking even to the point of death. Come on, you can face death and still be willing to be shaken for Christ. Why? Because you know that God can still produce some fruit even in an off season. Me and my wife, when we sat there in the hospital the last time we went in, and we had family that, that, that came in. We were in there for about 12, we, we stayed about seven days on the last run. We, we were in the hospital 11, 11 to 12 days, went home for a week. Couldn't even hardly stay home because of the pain and trying to manage and do everything. We had to go back to the hospital. We stayed in the hospital for another seven to eight days and went from there to hospice. We stayed in hospice for five days until she passed. While we were in the hospital on that last season, and when we went in there before we were coming in, when, when we sat down with the doctor and I could see his face sitting right there by the edge of the bed, he says, I'm just telling you, he says, I know it's unfortunate, but there is no cure for this. And it's really just kind of forming and shaping a little too quick. And, and we can do some radiation, but I'm just telling you right now, it, it's just palliative. It's not going to do anything. And he got up and, and he left and, and, and family was there on some and we sat there and my wife, me and my wife talked and, and, and some people looked and says, does she get this? D do do y'all understand? D did, does she really understand that? No, 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, she understands because we already had a talk because written down in her journal when she first got diagnosed with cancer, she says, I don't know why I have to face and go through this season, but I pray the Lord will use it to touch somebody else and I know that I am going to be healed one way or the other. That's how she started this. Now, we wanted to be here. Come on. We wanted to stay here. But we were already to the point that we realized that faith, it didn't matter what you shook. Faith wasn't changing. Come on. God was a good God regardless what he did. So it don't matter how bad the shaking came when he says, I don't have any more hope for you. And really, we don't have anything else we can do for you. And he just shook that tree one more time. But can I tell you, what was being produced was the fruit of Christ in the middle of that. Because in those last two days where she was actually 
uh, able to interact with people a little bit more because the pain was so bad that, that we had to kind of keep her so managed under pain that, that when it would come out, it would be so extreme. So there was moments that we didn't have time with her. But when we had moments of clarity there in those last two days, she was doing more ministry laying in that hospital bed than most of us do standing up walking in our free life. Laying on a bed. People came in, thought they were coming to talk to her. I just got to come encourage. Let me just come pray. I just got to come. I don't even know what to say, but I just want to be here. They'd walk in the room. She started ministering to them. I got to pray for you. She began to pray for them. She began to look up at the nurse and said, you know what? I'm not going to be here much longer. You know, I'm not going to make it, but I know where I'm going. If you were sitting in here, do you know where you're going? Mm, come on. Shaking. But fruit, fruit being produced that was still showing the glory and the goodness of God, it felt like the most, it was the most oddest thing. I told people and all of our family that was there through the whole process, this has been the strangest experience I've ever been through. It's the best, worst experience I've ever had. Because even though it was so ugly, God was doing so many beautiful things in the middle of it. I felt like I was on a mission trip. Anybody been on a mission trip? Like get out of the area like a mission trip. I ain't talking about trying to, trying to survive and go down to the next city to find something to eat. I'm talking about a mission trip. Like when you go out somewhere and all of a sudden you just, you realize that really it's all about just giving and seeing what God's doing. We were watching what she was doing there inside the bed. She took time with the children. She began to pray. She put her hand on my head and began to pray for me, knowing that I was going to be here. Come on. I'm talking there was a shaking, but shaking can produce some beautiful fruit, if you'll allow it. God can still work in some ugly ugly times. Can I tell you what you need is you need the fuel of faith. And it's too late to wait till you're laying in the bed to get your faith up. Huh. You see, if you ever went on a trip, you ever go on a long trip and all of a sudden you hit one of those highways and you're going down, you think you got an hour's worth of gas and all of a sudden you pass and realize, man, where's all the little Chick-fil-A's and everything going? And all of a sudden it just turns into some farmland and then you look up and it says next stop, 70 miles and you're like, oh, my God. And you start to calculate. Are we okay? Yeah, 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 we're okay, baby. And you're like, oh, my God, man, I, I got to slow this thing down, right? You, you start to look and you start to wonder, do you have enough inside the tank to get to where you need to get? Can I tell you that faith is a fuel? And if you'll put it inside your tank, when there comes a time that you don't have the ability or the capacity to put it in there, there will still be a reservoir. Come on. There will still be something on the inside of you that in the middle of something that you didn't think you had the ability to go and to make it through, you don't even know why you're still standing, why you're still praising, but something on the inside of you is still sustaining you. See, it's too late to get religious when you have a crisis. See, really what you're doing today is what's going to feed you tomorrow. My wife, my wife told the kids, and, and basically she's demonstrated and she showed this, what you nurture sooner or later is going to nurture you. What you feed sooner or later is going to feed you. And every morning before I'd go to work, she'd sit up in the front, the front room of the house and she'd sit there on the couch. That couch was never used for anything except Christmas morning, opening up gifts. And every morning she'd sit there and she'd just read her devotion. And I snapped a picture in the last couple months of her sitting there reading her devotion. And I kept that. And what a beautiful, what a beautiful thing. My children began to put that up. I put it up in there. Now every morning, instead of going back to my spot, I sit in that little couch right there and I read my devotions the way she did. And it's those type of moments that will sustain you. Well, I don't know why I need to read. I'm telling you, brother, I'm telling you, sister, if you're not putting it in, there's going to come a time that you're going to try to draw from the bank and you'll have nothing in there. There comes a time that you don't have the strength to pray. You simply have to operate on what's already on the inside of you. There's a time where you don't have the audacity to do anything more except to draw from what's inside. That's why this morning you were praising the Lord, you were lifting him up. Some of you were putting praise on your mouth. That praise is going to sustain you later. You don't even know that. She laid in a bed in the last, when she couldn't even hardly talk, we just began to play worship. I just put worship right there on the bedside with my phone. Nurses came in. I just put the little thing there. They would see. They would come in. We, we began to just let church, just, we just let praise emanate inside that room. And even when she couldn't say anything and when she was mumbled in speech because of the impact of what it was doing on the inside of her head, she began when it, it, the C.C. Winans came on and said, worthy of it all. Just sing. And she just raised that hand up. Laying in a bed, no strength to do anything. She just raising that hand up, giving the Lord praise. We saw nurses walking outside in the hallway crying. We saw people in hospice walking up saying, you know, I, I, I've never seen anybody handle this stuff the way that you all are handling. It's so beautiful. Why? Because faith can be shaken, but if faith is there, faith will sustain you.
faith will sustain you. It's a fuel. It's also an evidence. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence. Evidence of things not seen. Now, I work in law enforcement. We do everything based on evidence. We solve crimes based on evidence. You want to convict somebody? You better have some evidence. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen, meaning the mere fact that it exists is the fact that it doesn't exist. I mean, you read that verse and it just kind of throws you for a loop. You say, man, that's a wonderful play on words, but I don't even know that that makes any sense. I'm here to tell you that it does. See, if you came into a crime scene and you don't see somebody there, but you see a hat laying down, I could pick up that hat and I can extract the sweat off the inside brim of that hat and we can get the DNA and we can put who was inside that hat. I could take a firearm laying over here on the side and no, 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 nobody's holding it, but I can take a latent print and I can lift the sweat and the skin cells off of that phone and I could tell you, or off that gun and tell you who was holding it. I could find a drop of blood and I can tell you the DNA that comes back to the owner of the blood. See, when you as a believer stand, here's the one thing that we had as a takeaway is in this past season of our life, people were saying, you know, just the way your family, we had so many people come to the funeral that just were not churched people. And I led them through a prayer of salvation because guess what? I got you today. Come on. I got you today. And, and they wrote me, and I had so many people say afterwards, I never really understood faith, but I can't describe just, I, I'm taken back by looking at how strong your family is and how you make that declaration and how you show God. See, faith is the evidence. See, how is the world going to see the evidence of God? They're going to see him through you. Well, I don't see God, but I see you holding yourself in a way that just people don't hold themselves. Well, then you don't see me. You see the DNA of God. Then you see the drop of blood. Come on. Then you see the drop of Jesus Christ. You see the blood, the DNA of Christ that gives you the ability to stand through things you can't stand on your own. That's the power of the blood. That's the power of the evidence. How will the world see Jesus through you? And when the world looks at you and they say, how in the world do you talk like that, stay like that, hold fast to that? How do you do that? I don't even comprehend it. What they are saying is I am seeing evidence of something that I have never seen before. They are seeing the evidence of God. God coming alive on the inside of you, being shown. Faith allows you to see things other people can't see. How many agree with that? You realize faith, when you have faith, you have the ability to see things and to perceive things that other people look around and say, I don't see that. I know you don't. I know you don't because you ain't looking through the eyes of faith. Because you, you, you don't have the hope like I have. And you look at it through the physical lens, but if you would wipe those things clean, if you would let Jesus Christ cleanse from all that dirty filthiness and you would actually get some new set of eyes, you would see things you ain't been seeing. And your ears would hear things that other people don't hear. And it gives you the ability to have sight. Now, Daniel and them, they've been captivated, they've been left off, now they're sitting here, and all of a sudden King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, he saw this, this idol, and it was this, this grand thing, and he knew it was some kind of spiritual connotation, but he couldn't make sense of the dream, and he was so disturbed, he went to all of the Chaldeans, all the magicians, all of his wise men, he said, I need somebody to tell me about the dream that I saw and the interpretation. And they said, well... King Nebuchadnezzar, the way this kind of works is you kind of give us the details. You tell us what you saw, and we'll tell you what we think. I mean, we'll tell you what it means, right? And he says, no, no, no. I can't trust you to that. How can you give me an interpretation with wisdom if you don't even know what I dreamt? And they realize, but this has never happened before. This is not how it works. Yeah, that's, see, the world doesn't comprehend how you can do things because, uh, listen, God doesn't work the way the world works. And when Daniel found out that they were all going to be slain, the king said, if nobody can interpret this, then go ahead and round all these people up. Let's go ahead and put them to death because I ain't got no time for people who don't understand and can't provide the wisdom to the dream that I had. Daniel says, no, 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 hold, hold up, hold up. Give us a second because my God can reveal the nature of the dream. And they looked at him. Who in the world is this? Can I tell you, you don't wake up with that kind of faith. You walk in that kind of faith. You walk in a faith that when you get the report, it doesn't take you back like everybody else. Come on. When you find out the news, it doesn't take you back like everybody else. Why? There's already a reservoir of faith on the inside of you. says, well, I don't understand it. I don't like this. I don't agree with it. But I know God can still do something in it. We bought our grandbabies some of this, these little art boards and stuff where you got like a, a hidden picture behind this little white 
white film. You ever seen these little water, little water art books? And you take a pen that's just full of water and you go on this blank white page, it's just a blank white page, and you take the water pen and you just begin to stroke on it. And as you stroke on it, it gets wet and, and the little buffer material begins to give way so that you can see in transparency the colors and the art that's behind it. And you can sit there and you can get the whole page wet. And as you get the entirety of the page wet, you see exactly what was behind it that moments ago you could not even see. But after time, when the moisture dries up, guess what happens? It just resets itself. Now what you could see, when it becomes dry, you no longer see. So many people are looking at things in their life and they're saying, I just don't understand it. I just can't see. Can I tell you that faith and prayer and praise gives you the ability to see things in the middle of your crisis that otherwise you would miss. Come on. Sometimes you need some tears inside your eyes so you got some moisture to wet it, to wet that background. Come on. I got some sweat on my brow this morning. I could put some, I could wet some artwork. Come on. I could wet some artwork. Sometimes you need sweat from your labor in God. Sometimes you need tears where your heart becomes soft once again and you become moved by God and stop putting up such a hard shell that God can't break you and do anything. And when your eyes become filled with moisture and when your mouth becomes moistened with praise, you begin to wet the canvas of your issue and you begin to see the beauty that God is still working even in the midst of this. Even in the midst of bondage and captivity, God was still moving. Even in the midst of your crisis, when you don't see it, I'm going to tell you, you got to lean on your faith. you got to begin to press into God. And if you'll press into God, he'll begin to show you the things that you've been missing and haven't seen. Influence. So what happens when Daniel says, ah, King Nebuchadnezzar, I do have the dream. Well, do tell. Well, I will. You saw an image and it had a head of gold, had, had a chest and arms of silver, it had a a waistline of brass, it had legs of iron and toes that were cleaved together with iron and clay. And you saw a stone that came and it crushed onto the stones and caused the entirety of everything to crumble. And let me give you the interpretation, for yours is the kingdom of the head and the start of all the kingdoms, but as time goes on, they will become weaker and weaker and Christ will come in a day. How many of you know we're living in the days of the toes and the clay and iron? And Jesus Christ is coming to take over all rulership. And now all of a sudden, when they were able to get the revelation, all of a sudden King Nebuchadnezzar says, everybody should bow. No, 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 don't bow to me. But they elevated Daniel and put him over all the provinces. And now all of a sudden, because he was able to see things other people couldn't see, it elevated him into a position that you otherwise couldn't have. See, when you trust God in faith, it will elevate you. Sometimes to positions you want, sometimes to positions you don't want. But either way, it will elevate you into a position where he can get the glory. Now, one thing that's a truth, and if you'll think about it in your life, it's a truth and you can testify to it. That which blesses you for one season will test you in the next. Think about it. The thing that blesses you in one season can harm you and hurt you in the next one. You ever got a promotion? It was good when it came, but it was the most offensive and hurt you ever took in life on the way out. Come on. Ever had a friendship? The best friendship became the worst friendship. That which blesses you in one season will test you in another season. And I'm not saying in every circumstance, but I'm saying more often than not, that very thing that elevates you and allows you to feel the, the encouragement of being blessed will also be a position that God will test you in and will bring a shaking to see how do you hang on to the thing that I've blessed you with. And so now they're elevated, but now they were elevated, and now the problem is, is because they were elevated, all of a sudden now King Nebuchadnezzar starts to build this idol. So Daniel and these three boys have been elevated, they're over provinces and leading, and time goes by, and Nebuchadnezzar begins to erect this idol of this thing, that they, the thing that they had given the revelation to, the thing that elevated them is now going to test them and judge them. And now it's going to come to the point that he's going to say, I want everybody to assemble and to look at the beauty of this idol, and I want everybody to bow down. Well, it's going to come to the fact that they're going to say, ah, ah, hey, King Nebuchadnezzar, just so you're aware, you got three guys over here, and, and, and although it's your decree, they have yet to bow a knee to this idol, even though you have given a command. King Nebuchadnezzar says, what, what are you talking about? Everybody, when the sound of the timbrel and the music and everything plays and worship begins, everybody is to bow a knee, but they don't. Well, then bring them here. So now Nebuchadnezzar 
sees them, challenges them one more time, and in Daniel 3.16 is where you see it. It says, Now Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from this burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand. Now I want you to hear this. He's able to get us out of this, but he's going to get us out of this. Realizing that whether we perish here or not, he's got us. You understand the faith that's walking here? The faith that says, oh king, we're not going to be easy to say this to you, but we just want to let you know, God can get us out of this fiery furnace and he is going to deliver us from your hand one way or the other because you can take our life, but you can't take our destiny. And when this temporal body dissipates and fades away, I'm here to tell you there's something greater waiting. Come on. And you think you have control and you threaten me with this mortality, but there's an immortality waiting for me. So all you're going to do is speed up the process. So I'm here to tell you, oh, king, you can do what you want, say what you want. Our God is able to do it. But even if, even if he even if, can I tell you, you need to look at your circumstances and realize, stop gauging God on the fact of if he will, when he will, I wish he would. And why don't you just say, even if, even if, Zach, can you come up, brother? Even if, even if, so my bride sitting there in the hospital on the last day that we had in conversation, people had left the family, me and her sat there. We talked for a bit on the bed. From the time that she got, from the time that she got diagnosed with cancer, she, she had told me for a long time, you know my wife, she, she didn't like the pulpit. She did not want to be up here. She wouldn't come up here. This wasn't hers. This wasn't an area that she felt comfortable in. She would be at home when I would be preparing, she would be at home sitting in her chair, worshiping and praying for the service. If I went into the room to study, she would turn off the TV, she would put worship on. When I'd come back out, then she would stop her worship, and we would go back to our normal care. Every time I was pressing through, she was pressing in and breaking through. Come on. She'd be praying through for what God was going to do inside her service. I thank God I know she's still doing that. But she's doing it with all authority now, seeing and knowing the beauty of God. And so she was sitting there in the bed, and she says... You know, I said that if I ever got healed from this cancer, I wanted to tell my testimony. I was going to, uh, I was going to push myself out to, tear, to, to, to share my testimony. And, and we realized that there in that bed that God was going to heal her, but I was going to be the one sharing her testimony. And we had already settled. And so she, she began to tell me, I want you to tell people my story. Now, if you saw the funeral service, and it's online, you can see that there was a story, a testimony that she wanted me to share. Something she shared with our kids and family that she had never shared before to most people. Most people never knew anything. From the time she was five years old, she was being sexually abused by a known family member. Not just a one-time occurrence, not just, oh, wow, that happened to you? No, no, no. It went on in rapid succession, weekly, went on. Not just for one year, not for two years. It went on for about five to six years till she was 10 to 11 years of age. She was, great. She, was, she was being raised in church. She was hearing the Bible. She was hearing about God. But now she had seen all that, and as she was growing up and trying to collect, what does God really mean? And what is this faith thing that you talk about? When she was reasoning her own faith, she began to see this, and she said that she realized that she didn't think she could trust God. And she said the greatest battle she had was not the actual act of the abuse. The greatest battle she had was the byproduct of the abuse. Because now she wondered how in the world could such a good God allow such an evil, bad thing to happen to such an innocent person. And sometimes you let hurts push you away from God. But she wasn't content to be pushed away from God. She had a score to settle with God. She wanted to ask God. She wanted to know. I want to know how you could allow such an evil thing to happen to such an innocent child. And as she began to push and to ponder, she began to really read and began to look in, and she began to really find out the true revelation of Jesus Christ, who, guess what, was God's only son, who was an innocent, who was somebody who was pure, somebody who had no fault, had done no wrong, and yet, and yet, was abused, mistreated, stripped down, naked in front of a crowd, mocked in front of the people that he taught laughed at and scourged in front of the people that he had healed at one moment. And she realized, oh my gosh, why Jesus, 
He went through the same thing. He didn't even deserve that, and, 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 and he was an innocent, and yet that happened. And so she had this revelation of God. Isn't it funny how God can give a 10-year-old and an 11-year-old revelation, and we strain on it when we get older. Well, I don't know that I can make sense of God. My gosh, he's made the truth so evident, even a child can find it. Even a child can find it. And she began to move a little bit past that, but God was still working because now by the time she hits 13, the family member who had been abusing her was getting ready to die, was on his deathbed. And she was feeling pushed in her heart to forgive him. And she realized that Jesus said, listen, unless you forgive these who have hurt you, how can your heavenly father even forgive you? Isn't it funny how we shut that verse off? Come on, come on. If, you, if you've been in church a minute, you've been offended and you've been hurt. But isn't it funny how we, just, we, we can justify unforgiveness for somebody else? Well, God can justify unforgiveness for you. And so she said, what I realized is I needed to let him go. And she said, and I didn't want him to burn in hell for what he had done. And so I prayed that the Lord would save him. And she told it on that hospital bed, called the kids, and, and I think God has saved him. And I'm going to see him when I get there. That's the kind of grace and that's the kind of healing that can take place. That she realized that she told our kids, she pulled them by the bed, she says, I'm going to tell you all some things. And she began to say this. People inside the room, when they would come in and she would start sharing this, you could tell they just got awkward. They didn't like this, but she didn't care. She was using her closing moments to make a statement. She says, do not allow bitterness and unforgiveness to seize your heart. It will rob you of the potential that God has for you. And you got to let hurt go. That's what she said. you got to let hurts go. She told my children, she says, you got to let hurts go. Do not hold on to unforgiveness and bitterness. She said, it'll rob you. I laid there, or she laid there in the bed, and while she was laying there, I was walking through the room, and I was preparing her service. What do you want said, baby? I want you to tell him this. And I'm walking through the hospital room while she's laying in a bed, can hardly talk, and I'm preparing her service while she's laying here. And what is she doing? She's praying. Who's she praying for? She's praying for you. She praying for anybody who would hear this testimony that she asked me to share. And I'm here to tell you today that it doesn't matter what you've been through, even if, even if they did you wrong. Listen, sometimes you're, you're willing to fight things moving forward, but sometimes you need to look at what's fighting you. And sometimes it's not the battle ahead, it's the battle that you already thought you fought, but you still left the drama and the trash still sitting inside your heart. And you still got things that are impeding you from last season and wondering why you can't get into next season. Come on, that's the power of unforgiveness and bitterness. And you can justify why you can hang on to it. I know that. I know that. A little child who's been abused can justify why they hang on to that. But even if you have a just reason for hanging on to a bitter seed, you cannot deny the bitter fruit that it will grow inside your life. And she said, you got to tell them they got to let it go. They got to let it go. They got to let it go, even if they were done wrong. Stand to your feet here this morning. Here's what I want to challenge you with here this morning, because I believe God is a very intentional God, meaning very intentional to the fact that, that you're here today and this word is here today for you so that you can hear, so that you can receive. It's no coincidence that my wife passed away three weeks ago. It's no coincidence that I'm sitting here inside. Of, listen, I can tell you, I could be sitting inside a room. I could just be withdrawn, but guess what? This is what God this is the fruit that God can produce from a life. And I'd rather be here sharing the truth of what God can do in a life through a moment of hardship than sitting in a house trying to just go, woe is me. I'm here to tell you, God can produce some beautiful things through some ugly seasons in your life. And it doesn't matter what you've been through. Stop trying to gain the victory in the next season if you have not allowed God to purge and cleanse all those harms and hurts from last season. So here in a moment, I'm going to open the altar for two things. And some of you already know because God's already been kind of dealing with you. God's already been leaning on you and pressing on you. Some of you have something that now the Holy Spirit's bringing it to your mind. You realize, I got to let that go. You know, I never really thought about it. I thought I let him go. I thought I'd forget him. But I don't really know that I have. Here today, I'm going to ask you to step up and drop off some old baggage so that you can get to the next leg of your journey. There are some things that some of you think that you, maybe you've never really even dealt with, but it's time to drop off some old baggage so you can get to the next leg on the new journey. And there are some of you that are right now facing some things and you don't like what it looks like, you don't like what's coming on the grid, you don't like the things, the reports, 
the, the, the episodes, the things that you have been provided are now starting to create fear. And you don't know that you can trust God. But I'm here to tell you, faith in God can get you through this next season. Some of you have a need. I'm going to ask you to come down. I'm going to ask you to come down. I don't need to belabor you. You know who you are. If God's dealing with you, the Holy Spirit's dealing with you about letting something go, I'm going to ask you to come down. Come on. As you begin to come down, you're going to position yourself. God's going to give you freedom from last season. Because God can't do nothing in the new season until you're willing to let some of those things go. And maybe it's not about a bitterness. Maybe it's not about something that hurts you. Maybe it's just about something you're facing and you don't even know how you're going to stand in the face of what it is. Some of you have a season that is shifting right before your eyes. You have something new that is coming on the horizon of your life. And I'm here to tell you that you need the faith in God to stand in the middle of it. So that when the enemy comes against you and says, see, it ain't working. Ah, it ain't working like that. You can stand and say, even if it don't. Come on, somebody needs to come up here and just make a statement that says, even if. Even if. Even if it doesn't look good now, can I tell you, God still got you. Come on. God still got you. God still got you. God still got you. God still got you. Even if. Right now, for those of you who are up here, I just want you to begin to position yourself. I want you to begin to position your heart. I want you to be in the position your heart to go ahead and set those things before the Lord and just make a statement of faith. And simply by being up here and coming up to the front, you are making a statement that even if I'm trusting God and believing for Him to do something, it am I sure. There's somebody here who's been dealing with torment in your sleep. Somebody here who has not been able to shut off because the enemy just continues to torment your mind with all of the possible scenarios of your circumstance. And the Holy Spirit has been calling to you and pushing to you. And I'm not here to call you out. I'm just here to let you know that it's that very thing that the Lord is bringing to your mind now that he wants to give you freedom from. And sometimes stepping out is just simply saying, even if, even if, even if.
ending we're not ending there's still a season of breakthrough and prayer up here at the altars but here's what I want you to do right there where you're sitting right there where you're standing because just because you came to church don't mean you received anything just because you sat in the presence of something doesn't mean that you have any takeaway see takeaway is a choice takeaway is a choice truth can be seen it can be evident but takeaway is a choice in other words you have to choose what you apply and some of you are sitting there, and that's fine. You can stay right where you're at. In fact, that's what I want you to do. I want you to stay right there where you're at. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to position your heart to allow God to take you into the next season because some of you don't even know what the next season holds. Some of you right now need to realize that this is a moment. See, today you're not breaking through and you're not praising because of what you're facing now. You're praising because of what's coming. And as you begin to praise today, I'm going to give you a second to praise as they begin to push that out. And I want you to worship like you're putting something on the inside of your tank. Come on. We're going to let incense arise and we're going to begin to praise the Lord. And I want you to begin to put praise on your lips like you're going to have to eat off of it for the next week. Come on. I want you to begin to put something on the inside of your tank that can sustain you when your drama comes. Edamaha. Go ahead. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, Night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, and sin. 
Raise your hands up. Just raise your hands, and we're just gonna we're just gonna put a connection of praise up to the heavens. We're gonna put a connection of praise up to God. Remember, this has nothing to do. He's already worthy. Come on, He's already worthy. What you're doing is you're telling Himself, you're telling yourself that He's worthy. You're telling yourself that He's sufficient. You're telling yourself that He's able. You're telling yourself that even if it doesn't make sense, you're still gonna praise Him. Come on, I got anybody in the house that's gonna praise Him even if it doesn't make any sense. I got anybody in the house that's going to praise him, even if it hurts. Even if it seems like it cost you something you didn't think it would cost you. Is anybody in the house still going to praise him? Heavenly Father, you're worthy. Heavenly Father, you're worthy of it all. Heavenly Father, you're worthy of it all. You're a good God. 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 Thank you, Lord. My gosh, God is, God is so good. Come on. God is so good. He's so good in the fact that he's already made a way for you and you don't even know he's there. Because if the beginning of our days were already numbered, and if he had already purposed the pathways, then that means when you see him moving, he has already left handfuls on purpose for you. He has already put provision in your pathway. I'm here to tell you that you don't always have to go through great things to see a great God. 
And sometimes it's going to be in a hard season that you're going to realize and understand that he's so faithful to you. We are so blessed. We are so blessed that God has given himself to us in the manner that he has. Listen, I, I, I want to release with a prayer. I know you've got somebody who's going to come up and pray, and, and, and I'm not going to beat house etiquette. I'll let house etiquette play the way. I, I didn't come in here to take over your church. But I did come in here today to challenge you. I did come in here to tell you that it doesn't matter what you face. You serve a God who is greater. And what you're doing now is positioning you for what's coming. And if I could ever look back, I could just tell God he is. He's so good. God is so good. So good to us. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you, Lord. Lord, your word is true. Lord, the power of your word is truth. Whether we hear it or not, it's still truth. And Lord, I know the seed of truth has gone forth to some people who have, who have put it on the side and they've put it on the category of listening to, but Lord, I ask that you would cause their hearts to grasp it as they leave. Lord, I pray that as a season, as a moment comes, Lord, that they would have something that they could draw from, from today. Lord, I seal the word of truth over your body. Lord, I seal the word and the work of the Holy Spirit over hearts that have surrendered. Lord, here today in this house, come on, you know who you are. Those who have surrendered the old things, Lord, we are walking in victory. They are done. They are done. Lord, we are walking in freedom to a new season. We declare that it is done. Lord, we declare that you are sufficient for the season ahead of us. Lord, we declare that you are giving us spiritual eyes to see even in the midst of unseen things, things that we can't comprehend yet. Lord, we declare that we are beginning to get wisdom to navigate the crisis that we're in. Lord, we declare that you're given provision to navigate the crisis that we're in. Lord, we declare that you're given favor to sidestep those people that the enemy has put in pathways to hinder us. Lord, we declare that you are bringing healing and restoration within the house. You're bringing healing and restoration within our hearts. Lord, we declare that you are doing a good work and we put your praise on it and we seal it today in our hearts. If you'll seal it today in your hearts, why don't you give the Lord some praise and tell him amen. amen. What a word by the man of God. Why don't we clap it up for the man of God one more time? You know, Pastor Dale was supposed to close today, but he felt led to have me close. And as the evangelist was preaching, you know, I remember about eight years ago, I was in a place where I was, I felt like I was really lukewarm. Or I knew about God, but I was continually to do the things that I wanted to do. And I remember I told myself I was going to stop living that way. And I began to speak in tongues. And as I began to speak in tongues, I was like, oh, now I truly feel the presence of God. But then I went back to living the same way that I did. And I felt unworthy to speak in tongues. Because how could I speak this way but live my life completely different? And I remember about eight years ago he came to preach. And he was here in this house and I was standing there waiting for someone to come to pray for me. Not even knowing my situation, he came to me and he put his hand on me. And he said, go ahead and speak in that heavenly language, brother. God has ordained you to speak in that heavenly language. And I share that today. Because even though I stopped living that way, it was a weight that was still holding me down. And I believe that is why he preached that same message today. There are things that you have been dealing with in the past that is holding you back from the promises that God has already given you. God has already ordained you. God has already established you. He has promised you those things, but the enemy will try to keep you in that old living way. But you have been free. You have been redeemed. That grace has already covered the mistakes that you will make. So why don't we just close our eyes and lift our hands. Father God, we just thank you for today. The opportunity to come into your house and worship you. Because of who you are, God. Because you are deserving of our worship. So Father, I pray that you will be with your people as they leave here today. And they walk around, Father, as 
representations of you on this earth. So Father, I pray that throughout this week, I know there will be opportunities, but I pray that we take advantage of them to speak of the goodness of the God that we serve. Because if his wife can do it, while she was on her last couple days, with the health that is in my body, I will declare the goodness of Almighty God. Because your word says, let everything that has breath praise the name of the Lord. So I will worship you. Father, we thank you and we worship you. We pray these things in your son's mighty name. Amen and amen.